In this network topology, we have three devices, R1, R2, and R3. And each device performs a number of LISP roles. This LISP network is divided into two sites, Site 1 and Site 2. R1 represents Site 1 and R3 represents Site 2. We want to have LISP Site 1 communicate with 2 with LISP encapsulation, not using traditional mechanisms. So for our test to be successful, our LISP topology must consist of a number of LISP components. Firstly, the EIDs, endpoint identifiers. These are represented as loopback IP addresses on host R1 and R3, but in the real world they can be IP hosts such as a server or a laptop. The tunnel routers R1 and R3, these are the first hop devices that the EIDs connect to. They will perform list function of an XTR and ETR depending on the flow of traffic. The list control plane, also known as list mapping database, is located on R2. In its simplest form, it needs to know where the endpoints are connected to, and it knows this by holding the R lock to EID mapping. The R locks are just interface on the tunnel routers that the EIDs connect to. The list control plane consists of a map server and a map resolver. So let's jump on the LISP devices and discuss how we get this important R lock to EID mapping. That enables us to ping from site 1 to site 2 using LISP encapsulation. So let's jump on to R2, which is the control plane for the LISP. We issue a show LISP site summary. Site 1 consists of R1 and site 2 consists of R3. Each of these sites advertise its own EID prefix, which is local to each site. Now we jump on the tunnel routers. The tunnel routers are, are R1 and R3. We jump onto R1 and we issue a show IP list database. Here you can see the routing locator in site 1 is addressed 10.0.1.2. If we jump onto R2 and issue the same command, show IP list database on R2, you can see the routing locator for site 2 is addressed 10.0.2.2. Now you have to remember these routing locators. They're just a fancy way of saying an interface for router and switch. The R locks are interfaces that are located on the tunnel routers. Now let's jump back onto the control plane R2. We do a show list site name site-1 and this delves a little bit deeper into some information. The list control plane is a mapping database that holds the location, the routing locator and the identity, the EID of that endpoint. And this is what's known as the R lock to EID mapping. Site 1 has an identity EID 192.168.1.0 and it's connected to its routing locator 10.0.1.2. This is the R lock to EID mapping. If you do a show list site name site 2, we see that site 2 has an identity EID of 192.168.2.0. And it's connected to its local routing locator, 10.0.2.2. This is also the R lock to EID mapping. It is this R lock to EID mapping that needs to get pulled down by the respective site for site to site communication. So now we want to get site 1 to communicate with site 2. The tunnel route in site 1 sends a map request message to the list mapping system to get this important R lock to EID mapping for the remote endpoints that are located in site 2 that it does not have any local entry for. The list mapping system queries a tunnel route in site 2 and gets it to send back a map reply directly to the tunnel route in site 1 with the R locked EID mapping for its site. So now we issue a show IP list map cache on R1 to see if it has any information. No, if we have a negative entry for anything in site 2. Tunnel routers do not need to hold a large routing table for every single remote destination. It only needs to know about its local endpoints and for anything else it will query the LISP control plane. As you can see R1 and Site 1 holds no information for any remote EIDs in Site 2. So let's do a quick ping from Site 1 to Site 2 to trigger the LISP process and populate these local tables with the necessary information so that we can forward from site 1 to site 2 successfully. Let's ping the remote EID 192.168.21 but we need to source it from our 
This is an important aspect of the ping. You need to actually have that source address in. We have a success. Okay, let's check the show IP list map cache in our one. Now you can see it's populated with 192.168.2.0. Once it receives back this RLOT EID mapping for a remote endpoint, it will now store this in its cache and not to unnecessarily query the list mapping system.